Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Sunchitsa or Sunny Kanik. Uh, I'm an applied mathematician here in the Department of Mathematics at UC Berkeley. Uh, my interests are in uh, the development of uh, uh, new models and new mathematical theories to study those models uh, that are trying to describe uh, a new interesting novel uh, physical and physiological phenomena associated uh, with uh, applications in medicine. Uh, my research uh, is uh, highly collaborative. I work with a number of uh, mathematicians around the world, uh, as well as cardiologists uh, and bioengineers. Uh, not uh, only uh, here, for example, uh, some of my collaborators are at UCSF, uh, but also uh, in Houston, uh, where I uh, was uh, working before I moved here to UC Berkeley a couple of years ago. The uh, methodology or the way how research uh, and research is being done uh, in my group uh, is uh, uh, the following. So what uh, uh, I am interested in uh, is uh, mathematical modeling of uh, interesting and uh, important processes. You have been exposed, of course, a lot to the mathematical models recently uh, that describe the spread of COVID-19 uh, virus. Uh, I am not an epidemi uh, uh, epidemiologist, uh, but uh, my uh, interests do lie in uh, as I said, uh, uh, mathematical biology, biology and medicine. Uh, so there is uh, some overlap there. Another aspect of uh, my research is related to then uh, uh, after, uh, to the development of uh, mathematical uh, theories uh, that would uh, describe whether the models that are being uh, developed and used make sense in the sense uh, that uh, they have indeed a solution uh, which is reasonable and describes uh, the underlying uh, application uh, and that, that solution is unique and that it uh, continuously depends uh, on the data uh, in the model, on the parameters in the model and that it can therefore be described to a large number uh, of uh, uh, people or applications. And then uh, another aspect, uh, as is uh, shown here on this uh, slide, is uh, the development of uh, uh, computational models uh, that would uh, uh, actually be able to solve those mathematical models. Mathemat those mathematical models oftentimes are so complicated that it's not possible to find uh, an explicit solution. And so, of, uh, so that's why we uh, develop uh, computational methods to be able to approximate those solutions using high-performance computing. Uh, computing. Uh, and then together with cardiologists and bioengineers, uh, we uh, oftentimes uh, perform experimental validation of uh, the new models and uh, then also clinical applications whenever possible. So the goals uh, are uh, can be described by uh, first, uh, uh, we start by uh, trying to, again, solve a, a particular uh, biomedical uh, problem or understand a certain biology or biological problem, and then formulate uh, and prove uh, general mathematical results uh, that hold uh, not ju for just uh, that one problem, but to, that hold for uh, a large class of problems that uh, share uh, some common features. And so it is uh, uh, important to identify those uh, common features of these uh, problems uh, so that uh, what we develop for one application can be in fact applied uh, to uh, not just that application, but to a lot of similar uh, problems that fall into that uh, class of problems that can be addressed uh, using uh, the same mathematical theory. Uh, and then similarly develop general computational solvers that could be applied, uh, applied not only to that one biomedical problem, but to a large class uh, of problems that share some common features. 
And I'd say this is uh, where the main difference between perhaps uh, engineering approaches and mathematical approaches lies, which is that uh, in addition to in fact trying to solve that particular biological application, we're trying to also understand the, the general um, reasons or laws uh, why certain uh, things work and uh, why other things don't work, uh, and also um, describe or let's say prove mathematically rigorously uh, that those models indeed do have solutions uh, so that we are not uh, solving problems that might not in fact even have solutions or that do not represent uh, the solutions of which don't represent a, a particular problem. Um, so the project uh, that I am uh, uh, that I have been working on for the past uh, few years, uh, some of those projects are listed here on this uh, slide. Uh, one of the projects is uh, related to uh, transcatheter aortic uh, valve replacement, uh, uh, which uh, entails uh, uh, replacing. So what you see is a part of the uh, heart. Uh, uh, and so in this region right here where my mouse is uh, showing, uh, you have uh, uh, an aortic uh, valve uh, that uh, sits between uh, the left ventricle and the uh, ascending aorta. Um, oftentimes uh, in certain patients, uh, uh, one needs to replace uh, this valve. Uh, and so uh, one way to do this uh, is to insert a new bioartificial valve using a catheter procedure, uh, which is mounted, that valve is mounted on uh, this uh, mesh-like device uh, called a stent, which is uh, used uh, to anchor the valve uh, at its right uh, position. And it is the design uh, of these uh, stents uh, that uh, I have been uh, involved with uh, and was using uh, some uh, pretty heavy mathematical machinery uh, for hyperbolic conservation laws defined uh, on the graphs to in effect study and optimize the design of these uh, types uh, of uh, medical devices. And I am going to say a couple of more words about that uh, in the second half of today's lecture. Another project I was involved with is uh, this uh, mitral valve uh, regurgitation, in particular uh, a non-invasive uh, uh, non uh, 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 detection uh, of uh, mitral valve uh, regurgitation uh, and how to improve uh, uh, echocardiography, which is used uh, in this minimally invasive uh, uh, detection of mitral valve uh, regurgitation in certain cases, and I'm going to talk about that as well. Uh, then uh, uh, stent and the stent graft uh, design uh, for the treatment of uh, coronary uh, artery stenosis using uh, coronary angiography uh, with uh, stenting. Uh, I'm going to show a couple of more, a couple of slides related to that. And then uh, recently after moving here to UC Berkeley, I started working with the collaborators at UCSF uh, on the design using mathematical models to help uh, optimal design of uh, bioartificial pancreas uh, for type 1 diabetic patients. Uh, and recently, a couple of weeks ago, I was contacted by a researcher at Melinda and the Bill Gates Research Institute uh, to see uh, whether we can help with our already existing models uh, and then developing additional uh, parts of those models that would uh, perhaps address uh, the use uh, of uh, standard surfactant uh, uh, replacement therapy uh, that is being developed uh, uh, for different types of patients, neonatal patients, uh, to perhaps uh, uh, help uh, the uh, COVID-19 patients uh, uh, deal better uh, with the resulting uh, complications of pneumonia associated uh, with COVID-19. So let me start uh, talking a little bit about uh, uh, what we have done related to this uh, endovascular uh, stents uh, design. Uh, 
So what you see here is coronary arteries, this grayish brown area uh, that sit on the surface of the heart and obviously uh, are a very important in uh, supply of the heart muscle. Uh, so they, they provide the main, the blood flow, uh, which supplies uh, uh, food, nutrients, and oxygen to the heart muscle. Uh, so occlusion uh, or stenosis of a coronary artery is a typically a precursor for a heart attack. Uh, because, of course, downstream uh, from uh, the location of the lesion uh, of the blockage of the artery, uh, that would cause uh, the downstream heart muscle to starve to death, which is effectively uh, what heart attack is. So, of course, it's in an interest to treat this, and one way to do it is to insert a catheter uh, with a balloon mounted on it and this uh, metallic mesh uh, that is uh, sitting on the outside of the balloon which is being expanded by the balloon, the plaque deposits inside of the artery are being pushed against the wall uh, with the balloon expansion. And uh, this uh, metallic mesh called a stent uh, is being anchored uh, at the walls uh, in the, at the location of the lesion uh, to keep the arteries open and provide normal blood supply, uh, help provide normal blood supply to the heart muscle. Uh, some of the people that you may know who uh, had uh, this procedure done are Bill Clinton, Dick Cheney, uh, David Letterman, Mother Theresa, and, uh, and many, many more. So there are many open questions related to the design of these uh, stents uh, from the uh, mechanical point of view, uh, as well as from uh, the more chemical point of view in the sense that uh, there are stents, as uh, some of you probably know, drug eluting stents uh, uh, that uh, uh, use uh, different types of drug coating of the uh, stents and stent uh, struts, uh, which are these uh, small parts of the stents, uh, 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 to prevent the different kinds of uh, potential complications uh, after following these kinds of procedure. Uh, related to instant uh, restenosis uh, or also thrombosis. Uh, and so we have been working on addressing many of these uh, questions, uh, but what I'm going to talk to you about today a little bit is to uh, address a, a relatively basic question of how does the geometry of these uh, stent uh, struts, um, so let me see here uh, if I can show you uh, different types of stents. So you see uh, here, you see four different uh, types of uh, stents. Each of them has a different uh, distribution of these uh, basic components called the stent struts again. How does the geometry of that distribution uh, determine the mechanical overall emerging, emergent mechanical properties uh, of these devices? Which of these uh, stents for example, uh, have a, a less uh, bending rigidity, uh, can bend more easily, and might be more suitable for the use in uh, curved uh, coronary arteries. And uh, so uh, what we have done uh, is uh, we have used uh, something that I have been working on uh, uh, many years ago, which is related to uh, the study of solutions of uh, partial differential equations called the hyperbolic partial differential equations that are defined on these kinds of geometries uh, uh, on nets or networks. Uh, and so uh, I used uh, uh, some ideas uh, from those mathematical theories that has uh, helped uh, my group and me uh, design uh, models uh, that would be considerably simple and simpler and easier to simulate computationally uh, that would give us information about the overall mechanical properties of these uh, types of devices. And uh, so this uh, boils down to st studying in terms of mathematical equations uh, the so-called one-dimensional hyperbolic conservation laws that are defined uh, on a mesh-like or a net-like or a graph-like uh, domain. Uh, the ideas that were developed uh, in that mathematical theory uh, applies to, uh, again, a much larger class of problems, including, for example, studying the mechanical properties uh, of tissue scaffolds 
or carbon nanotubes uh, in material science and so on. And so what we did was we used uh, uh, in, uh, the theory of hyperbolic conservation laws to describe uh, how uh, uh, to describe the mechanical properties, the global mechanical properties of these devices in a relatively simple way, uh, to study how in this uh, curve the coronary arteries that sit on the surface of the heart and contract and expand as the heart contract, uh, uh, contracts and expands. Uh, what kind of geometric uh, uh, stent uh, strata distribution is optimal in order for a stent uh, to be bendable, so to speak, uh, to be appropriate for the use uh, in uh, these types of uh, curved uh, coronary arteries. And so what we did was we uh, developed a model uh, that takes into account uh, the uh, blood flow through a coronary artery, the contractions uh, of the heart muscle, and the presence of a stent inside uh, uh, that artery, so it's a couple of the fluid structure interaction problem for which we develop the equations and the theories you will uh, see in just a second. And we're able to develop the computational solver that would simulate that kind of scenario. This is a computational mesh uh, for a curved coronary artery with a stent. And we're able to produce uh, these kinds of simulations of portions of that uh, artery treated with a stent in the in the uh, contracting and expanding state. So here you see uh, the computational simulation uh, of two types uh, of uh, also of uh, fluid structure interaction involving two different stents. One is this express-like stent shown uh, on the left, and the other one is a, a cipher stent shown on the right. And so uh, you could see if you. Uh, pause the simulation uh, at the moment when the, the arteries contract, you could see uh, that there would be a significant uh, amount of damage uh, that would be impacted by the presence of a certain type of stent like a Palmaz or a Xion stent uh, in contrast uh, with, for example, Cypher stent. Uh, and so uh, these kinds of locations are possible locations of stent protrusion uh, into the uh, intima layer uh, of the artery, which is uh, um, associated, in fact, uh, with internal uh, elastic lamina injury, in the injury of the intima layer, uh, which has been associated with inflammatory responses uh, and in the instant uh, restenosis complications following, known complications uh, following that procedure. And then we uh, here uh, generated the movies uh, which show the colors in these movies uh, show the distribution of the so-called von Mises uh, stress, uh, which uh, measures uh, the maximal distortion of the, of the arterial wall, uh, so the intramural stress. Uh, which uh, is associated again with uh, injury and uh, wall trauma, uh, which again uh, has been known uh, to be associated with uh, different types of uh, 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 complications uh, associated uh, with these types of procedures. So high, uh, uh, high, uh, let's say, maximal wall distortion uh, is denoted here by red, uh, and the uh, blue and the uh, light uh, green uh, correspond to low von Mises stress. And so just by very quickly observing the performance uh, of these uh, four different stents, uh, one can see if I fix uh, uh, the contraction, if I fix these movies at a certain point in time, one can see that in fact uh, uh, this, this uh, cipher stent uh, uh, seems to uh, be causing minimal damage to the native arterial wall in comparison to the other three stents. Okay, so um, I hope that I was able to convince you uh, uh, in the first half of the talk that we were able to use uh, our mathematical models uh, and scientific computing to in fact uh, uh, work on the design, optimal design of a stent for cardiovascular interventions in curved uh, coronary arteries. 
we actually, or uh, in addition to uh, the uh, real world application, we're developing uh, mathematical techniques uh, that uh, or theory uh, uh, using which we were able to prove uh, uh, the existence of a solution to this class of problems uh, in the design of the computational schemes that are being used not only that application that I showed you uh, in the first half of the lecture but also in a much wider class of problems. Uh, let me uh, finish uh, my presentation by showing you just uh, this uh, one more example that we studied together with cardiologists in Houston, uh, which is related to the mitral valve regurgitation. Uh, and so this is going to be interesting uh, for many different points of view. I hope that you're still uh, present here and that you're following what I'm talking about, namely. So what you see here is a uh, a mitral valve uh, which uh, sits between the left atrium, which uh, the left uh, ventricle, which is where we are sitting, where the camera is sitting now, uh, and the left uh, atrium, which is on the other side of the valve. Uh, and so during the contractions of the left ventricle of the heart, uh, the valve is uh, supposed to close uh, completely so that uh, the entire flow would go through the aortic valve to the uh, to the ascending aorta, but in uh, many patients the valve doesn't close properly and so uh, there is some backward uh, regurgitant, uh, regurgitant flow that uh, flows from the left uh, ventricle where we are sitting right now into the left atrium. Uh, and so uh, one of the main uh, 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 and simplest way how to diagnose uh, this kind of condition, which is known as the mitral uh, valve regurgitation, is to use echocardiography or ultrasound. Uh, so color echocardiography here, which shows, uh, so what you see here uh, on this picture is the left ventricle where we were sitting before, the left atrium, and the valve is supposed to be closed. Uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, what you see in this image is the a flow, which is colored. So this is color Doppler uh, image. Uh, so it's a flow that flows backwards, regurgitates uh, through the mitral valve uh, into the left atrium. And so most uh, of the regurgitant uh, jets are uh, central, which is what is shown here on this picture on the left. But there is a number of those that are not central that hug the walls of the left atrium which is the case in this uh, picture. And this is in fact, uh, in this case, using uh, ultrasound, uh, namely color echocardiography, uh, is, uh, uh, has been shown uh, that uh, produces a gro gross uh, underestimation of regurgitant volume, uh, especially by inexperienced uh, observers, uh, namely inexperienced uh, uh, practitioners who are actually capturing and uh, reading these images. And so, uh, in fact, this is one uh, of the greatest challenges in echocardiographic assessment of uh, mitral uh, valve regurgitation. Uh, so uh, it's important to assess uh, the mitral uh, valve regurgitation volume uh, correctly because based uh, on the MR volume, a patient may or may not be referred uh, for further evaluation and potentially surgery. Uh, and so we were asked to uh, see how we can in fact uh, describe uh, uh, and understand why is uh, this volume uh, underestimated and what happens in the case uh, when this regurgitant uh, jet instead of being central actually uh, hugs the wall uh, of the native, uh, native atrium. Uh, and so what uh, we uh, were working uh, uh, on was to uh, help the cardiologists uh, uh, who were able to, in fact, design uh, this uh, heart chamber uh, at the Methodist Heart Lab uh, that uh, simulates the left uh, ventricle and the left uh, atrium uh, with an orifice uh, in between simulating uh, the uh, uh, regurgitant valve. Uh, what we were asked to do was to produce the flow conditions that uh, would lead to this kind of behavior of uh, eccentric uh, or so-called Kawanda effect uh, jets. Uh, and so it turned out that uh, uh, when uh, they started doing experiments in this heart chamber that they could not capture the case uh, that was producing uh, those eccentric uh, Kawanda regurgitant jets. Uh, the goal was to produce those jets and then use uh, 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 ultrasound to image those jets in, in this uh, 
heart chamber and conclude uh, and analyze why and how is it uh, that those uh, jets appear smaller uh, on the ultrasound image than they actually are and to help uh, uh, then estimate the regurgitant volume uh, uh, more closely to reality correctly. Uh, and so what uh, we did, so this is a, an image of regurgitant flow in the flow chamber. Uh, this corresponds to the left uh, ventricle and the left uh, atrium. So you see the flow regurgitating from the ventricle to the atrium. Uh, and so what we uh, uh, did was we used numerical simulations to create this uh, so-called Kowanda effect, uh, which is described uh, by the uh, fluid hugging uh, the curved walls uh, near the orifice. Uh, in this case, uh, so what we did was we used the uh, Navier-Stokes equations for an incompressible fluid such as blood uh, to model the blood flow in that type of geometry and uh, used the so-called fluid structure interaction uh, that was describing the interaction between blood flow and the opening and closing of the valve. Uh, which was modeled uh, using certain uh, accepted uh, models. And uh, so what uh, uh, this is uh, the actual heart chamber and this is our computational mesh approximating uh, that heart chamber. Uh, and so what we did among other things, this is a, the, our one of the first simulations, the side view uh, of the regurgitant flow, which is supposed to uh, correspond to, to this case scenario actually with a pretty good uh, 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 flow agreements. But what we did uh, then, uh, uh, so this was producing, uh, as you could see here, uh, central rigor, uh, sorry, uh, central regurgitant jet. Uh, so we were also wondering uh, what are the flow conditions and orifice geometries that would produce that uh, wall hugging Kowanda jet. And so we actually, uh, um, using mathematical analysis and numerical simulations, uh, were able to produce a, a bifurcation diagram, which tells us uh, how uh, the type of uh, flow through uh, that orifice, uh, uh, so what kind of flow, what type of flow happens through the orifice and for which values uh, in the orifice geometry, namely the aspect ratio of the orifice, the length versus the width of the orifice, uh, and uh, another parameter in fluid flow describing, so to speak, uh, how fast the flow is going, the Reynolds number, depending on two, those two parameters, uh, there is a, a bifurcation diagram which describes uh, how the flow flows through the orifice uh, uh, and uh, from behaving as a symmetric flow, which is uh, shown here, to the loss of symmetry, uh, um, to the loss of symmetry, which actually corresponds to, uh, let's say, the precursor for the Kowanda uh, wall hugging jet through the Kowanda effect. And so, what we were able, in fact, is to uh, show that. So, this is a sketch of the mitral valve. This is a mitral valve. Uh, so, we used uh, uh, the length versus the uh, width of the orifice uh, as uh, uh, one of the parameters uh, in uh, our model. And we showed, first of all, computationally, we were able to produce uh, this type of Kowanda effect uh, flow. Uh, oh, this is uh, uh, our full 3D simulation of regurgitant flow through the orifice uh, from the left ventricle to the left uh, atrium, uh, which was then uh, compared to what is typically uh, clinically observed uh, for these eccentric uh, Kowanda uh, jets, uh, which is uh, what I am showing here, now superimposed the 3D simulation over the ultrasound image. Uh, and so what we were able to show, in fact, based on that bifurcation diagram, is that um, the valves uh, that exhibit these types of Kowanda wall-hugging jets uh, have to be uh, long and narrow, so the orifices are long and narrow, uh, and uh, uh, they appear for certain Reynolds numbers for certain relatively fast uh, uh, flows. Uh, and so based on this, uh, we were able to in fact uh, uh, suggest uh, uh, how to uh, improve the um, uh, improve uh, uh, the detection uh, and the severity, uh, estimating the severity of mitral valve regurgitation in, in these uh, case scenarios. 
Uh, and what's another interesting thing uh, related to Coanda effect is uh, something that I've noticed recently uh, uh, in 2019, uh, Dyson hair curler uh, was actually made uh, based on the concepts uh, that are associated uh, with the Coanda effect. First, uh, what I wanted to say is that our paper here uh, discussing this Coanda effect and wall hugging jets was uh, published in 2016. Uh, so then uh, Dyson, in fact, uh, uh, in this uh, movie by Dyson is showing the flow, which gets uh, attracted by a nearby surface and you get, a, instead of a straight flow, you get this uh, wall hugging effect. And so what they used, uh, how they used it here is that they effectively generated these uh, slots are in fact, those, in fact those long and narrow orifices that we were talking about. And so flow is generated inside, there is a little pump inside of this uh, curler. Uh, that is generating flow at a certain Reynolds number uh, that is then let go uh, through these uh, thin, long and narrow orifices of a certain geometry that generates the flow that attracts the hair to the curler. Uh, and, uh, and this is how hair is being dried at the same time uh, as it is being curled. Uh, so something cute, uh, some physics uh, and mathematics applied to real life uh, uh, problems that uh, many people or women may be using in uh, dealing with their hair. Uh, so what we did as part of that project is, in fact, was also developed a constructive uh, existence proofs for fluid structure interaction problems. Namely, we looked at the models uh, that uh, I was talking about earlier. Uh, related to uh, describing the interaction between blood flow and the motion of the arterial wall, stents, and the motion of the heart, um, the surface of the heart. Uh, and uh, we, uh, in fact, were able to prove that those models, we, were, we in fact, developed uh, uh, techniques that can be used for the whole, so mathematical techniques that can be used for the whole entire class of problems uh, to prove, uh, it, to check whether the uh, solution exists, to prove the existence of a so solution, uh, and uh, see how then uh, analyze how the solution depends on the parameters in the problem. In the main steps uh, of our proof, actually we were able to use in the design of our computational schemes, uh, uh, that uh, produced uh, those uh, simulations that I showed you earlier. And so this opened the door to study even more general fluid structure interaction problems, which is something that uh, we are working on right now, uh, uh, related to the design of uh, implantable bioartificial pancreas for the treatment of type uh, 1 diabetes, uh, which is based uh, on, in fact, uh, uh, using uh, the um, healthy donor pancreatic cells that are seeded in a gel, uh, a poroelastic material. Uh, and so with the sufficient supply of oxygen and nutrients, uh, uh, that the gel with the seeded healthy pancreatic cells at a certain point starts producing insulin. And so this can be implanted into a patient as an, a bioartificial organ. But typically these kinds of implants are known to have major cha challenges related to the long-term use of immunosuppressants. So what the team around Dr. Shuvor Roy at the UCSF uh, uh, has been working on is designing uh, these kinds of uh, semi-permeable membranes that are used to encapsulate uh, uh, this bioartificial pancreas, bioartificial organ between these kinds of uh, semi-permeable membranes that allow passage of uh, nutrients and oxygen that are needed for the uh, function of the pancreatic cells, uh, but prevent uh, uh, serve as a barrier for the immune cells uh, uh, that are being produced, of course, uh, by the recipient uh, uh, of the organ, uh, and so this might be uh, this this might be a solution to uh, general uh, implantation therapies uh, uh, to avoid the long-term use uh, of uh, immunosuppressants. So what we were asked to do, in fact, is to so there are many challenges. Uh, so one of the questions that we uh, were asked to answer is that within uh, this encapsulation chamber, uh, we, uh, what is the design, uh, what do the pores, how should the pores of that gel look like that would allow a maximum uh, uh, access to 
so transport and diffusion of oxygen uh, and the nutrients, uh, and uh, how can connecting uh, this device uh, to the blood flow uh, improve this advection enhanced uh, uh, supply of oxygen, uh, so transport enhanced uh, supply of oxygen and nutrients uh, to uh, the device, to the islets, to the healthy pancreatic cells. And so for that, we again uh, needed to uh, we were able to use our fluid structure interaction solver to study the blood flow uh, that uh, feeds uh, the uh, bioartificial pancreas with uh, uh, nutrients and oxygen, uh, study filtration flow through this poroelastic uh, gel, uh, and then uh, study the concentration of oxygen uh, for different kinds of different types of um, gels that are being used to seed. Uh, those are healthy uh, pancreatic cells. Uh, and so let me stop here. I hope that I was able to convince you that there is a lot of exciting research in mathematics uh, uh, that is also applicable uh, to real life problems and to medicine. And I uh, hope uh, uh, to see you at a certain point uh, uh, at UC Berkeley and that you are all staying uh, healthy and safe.